Good afternoon, everyone, or good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, my name is Paolo Barlera. I'm the interim director of the Italian Cultural Institute in New York, and I'm happy to welcome you to another one in our series of webinars um, or virtual events, as we like to call them. Uh, today's webinar brings me, in fact, back of a few months uh, because this presentation was actually part of the Institute's regular programming and uh, had unfortunately to be canceled on account of the lockdown and we were very sorry to have to, not to have um, our, our, our distinguished guests with us. So I'm particularly pleased that today we are able to make it up in a sort of way, although at a distance. Um, not long ago at the Institute, we uh, organized a series of events where we talked about Italy through the lens of American writers. And today, we ideally, we continue that series, uh, but we'll be looking at Italy not through the lens of a writer, but through the lens of a doctor. And to do that, we're happy to have with us from Rome, uh, Dr. Susan Levenstein, the author of Dottoressa, as you can see, the, and you see the, the, the cover of the book, I think, on the shared screen. Um, Dottoressa, an American doctor in Rome and from New York, uh, to converse with her, we are honored to have Alexander Stille, a writer in his own rights with many books and essays about Italy. And I think it will be particularly interesting to hear their different opinion, opinions and uh, experiences about Italy. So thank you, um, Dr. Levenstein and, and Dr. Stille, if I may say so, for, for joining us. Um, before leaving the, the screen and the microphone to you, I would like to remind our viewers that uh, they can ask questions through the chat box in their Zoom application. Um, and we'll, we'll have a 20, 25 minutes uh, uh, um, section of, of the webinar at the end to answer your question. And also I would like to remind uh, viewers that they can adjust their screen when the uh, PowerPoint presentation is on um, through as, uh, going through the view options and select uh, side by side just so that they can see both the um, presentation and the speakers at the same time. So thank you everyone for joining us for this uh, presentation and uh, I leave the microphone to Dr. Levenstein. Thank you. Mr. Badalera, I don't know how to thank you for letting this event happen. I was really disappointed when we couldn't do it in March and I'm very, very glad that we could go on to it now. Okay, I'm gonna spend some time reading from the book, um, but first I wanna just give a little bit of history, a little bit of background. First of all, to establish my creds as a New Yorker, this is in the Pomenock Housing Project in Queens, me as a child. This is really the origin of the book. When I first went to Italy in 1970, um, you can see uh, this was a small town in Sardinia where the girls and the women were all sequestered behind their balconies. And you can see my mini skirt. Then I went back to the United States, having fallen in love with Italy. I went back to the States and I went to medical school and did an internal me medicine residency in New York. And during that time, I married an Italian man, Andrea Di Vecchia, and I dragged him back to Rome somewhat reluctantly. This is him um, taking care of uh, doing the vendemia, doing the grape harvest in 1982. By that time, I had gone through the process of becoming a licensed, Italian, licensed physician in Italy, which notably meant doing an internship at the Nuovo Regina Margherita Hospital in Trastevere. This is the Nuovo Regina Margherita Hospital. Um, what you see is the 14th century um, courtyard. Um, it used to be a monastery, as you might guess. Now, let me go on to the book. For every, every reading, I will mention the name of the chapter that it comes from is written underneath. This one is, for example, wet paint on my shingle. 
In the Italy where I landed, men were men, women were women, and grown-ups didn't dress like kids. On Via del Corso, gaggles of bright-clad girls drifted like so many posies from store to store. Old women plodded past in black, wealthy shoppers wore silks and heavy jewelry, guys wore three-piece suits, and housewives wore conservative dresses, and they were all without pause and without exception, giving each other the once-over. For Italians, your looks project your inner self, and being dressed is a far cry from merely being covered. Two women heading in opposite directions will scan each other from coiffure to pumps within four paces, clocking every detail. For them, the street is not the shortest path between two points, but a theater for seeing and being seen. If you skulk along in the shadows trying to avoid attention, they'll tinge their appraising stare with a smirk. Trying to emulate impeccable Italian professional women I felt like a Bigfoot stepsister attempting to squeeze her pedal extremity into Cinderella's shoe. In New York, I'd wore corduroy slacks and Clark's wallabies inside the hospital, blue jeans elsewhere, as you can see. But in the Italy of 1980, no woman over 20 wore either pants or flat shoes. It was bad enough to be American, which by definition meant devoid of fashion sense but I was a particularly androgynous member of a particularly style-scorning subculture, and as a doctor, it wasn't enough to pass. I had to impress. No help from shop personnel. Their mission was less to sell clothes than to cultivate a stable of good customers and drive away any new entries whose inelegance would detract from the store's panache. In a boutique above my station, I once referred to the one-inch heels on a shishi sandal as comfortably low. Low, sneered the sales girl. They're not low, they're high, extremely high. The harem atmosphere, the mirrors outside rather than inside the fitting rooms, the girls adjusting the folds on my body. For an ex-hippie seeking acculturation, it was all one blur of embarrassment. One day, I felt confident enough to brave the sales girls on Corso Vittorio Emanuele, and I came home with a pastel green linen suit, two-inch beige heels, and a matching purse. I'll never forget that outfit's first airing in the hospital. Nurses, docs, and wheelchair pushers alike complimented me on finally dressing right. At first, I would get dolled up to see patients, but otherwise stick to American sloppy until one day I went in dungarees to a private hospital to look at an x-ray. I ran into the director in the hall. He glared over his glasses. Next time you come here, you'll come dressed like a physician. My very first month in Rome in 1978, I felt a breast lump. I checked into a small private hospital for a biopsy and got to chatting with a young doctor who recorded my history and my blood pressure. Still under the optimistic illusion that the Italian consulate in New York was arranging my medical license, I told her I was looking for work. In the morning, she came in with news. She had found me a job. I was thrilled. She went on to explain the job wasn't taking care of patients, but drawing blood in a laboratory. Lesson number one in medical economics, the uh, doctors were a glut on the market. The reason was open admissions, that is, anyone who wanted to go to med school could. Since 1923, a graduate of an elite liceo could study whatever university subject they wanted, including medicine, and in the 1970s, that privilege was extended to regular high schools. In post-war Italy, where genteel 20-year-olds had little better to do than to kick around a soccer ball, like the characters of Fellini's Vitelloni, and university courses cost next to nothing, why not sign up? It was more respectable than being unemployed, warded off boredom, made mama happy, and let you fiddle low risk with a fantasy of becoming a doctor. And sign up they did in droves. During the 1980s, 1,200 medical students would be crammed into lecture halls built for 400, without counting those who were on the books but never bothered to show up for class. Only one in three ever graduated, but even that was way too many. Every year, 
Italy, population 56 million, granted as many medical degrees as the United States, population 236 million. By 1994, the head of the Medical Association was pleading with young people not to choose a medical career. When I got to Italy, one in four of all licensed physicians was out of work, so the default position after medical school was obviously unemployment. I had not picked the best time to immigrate. Italian med school is now highly selective, but the norm is still to straggle to the finish line a year or more behind schedule, and one in three med students still drops out altogether. Italian universities let you proceed at your own pace. So as your interest fades, you can let the exams you sit dwindle year by year from eight to four to none. Those who fall by the wayside do, however, eventually have to face mom and dad. One medical student I knew didn't take any exams after his second year, finding it suited him better to DJ at a local radio station. He managed to keep his lack of progress a secret from his parents for three years, following which all hell broke loose. Another med school dropout got into the papers by going one step further. He kept up the pretense all the way to what would have been graduation time, and then to spare his parents the shame of discovering his perfidy, shot them. When his case came to trial, he threw himself on the mercy of the court on the grounds of being an orphan, thereby fulfilling the traditional definition of the Yiddish word chutzpah. On a bright June afternoon in 1979, I sat on my couch, listening to our friend Antonio perched on one of those rock hard Italian armchairs, pour his heart out, his wife's distance, his suspicions, I asked sympathetically if I could get him a glass of wine. He was so astonished that he stopped crying. No, why on earth would I want wine? I had to consult a native informant to discover what an Italian would offer in similar circumstances. Coffee, brewed expressly for him, the meaning of espresso, as a sign of affectionate support. In Italian, you look like you need a drink is a nonsense sentence. Most Italians do consume alcohol every day, but it's not what we call drinking. For Americans and Northern Europeans, alcoholic beverages are mind altering drugs used as tranquilizers, sleeping potions, inhibition looseners, candy is dandy, but liquor is quicker, Agda Nash, or roads to inebriation. That is to say, to getting tipsy, high, drunk, plastered, smashed, sloshed, sozzled, soused, crocked, and so on and so forth. That's just my own personal vocabulary. Italians reach that state so infrequently that their language provides only a few tame options. Ubriaco, drunk, brillo, tipsy, alticcio, high, sbronzo, drunk again, with at most perso, lost, or fradicio, rotten, tacked on for a touch of color. They don't even have a proper word for a hangover, though if pressed, they'll come up with the stately postumi della sbornia, the after effects of overindulgence. For Italians, wine and beer are foods. If they provide a little buzz, that's just a pleasant side benefit, improving the sparkle of the conversation. When I first traveled in Italy, parents regularly fed wine-laced water to their kids, aquavino, vaccinating them against later dipsomania. And at lunchtime in the cafeteria of the Nuova Regina Margherita Hospital, the docs would jostle to sit at the, at the chaplain's table because he'd always bring a bottle of good country wine. Even the harder stuff fits into a culinary protocol. A 7 p.m. Campari is meant to, wet, meant to wet the appetite, the cognac or amaro at the end of a large meal to aid digestion, which is why in proportion, Italy has one-tenth as many problem drinkers as America. The great B-Day mystery, what's it for? Americans can live in Italy for decades, thinking Italians go to the trouble of installing B-Days just so they can soak their feet or cool their beer. If they've read Henry, Henry Miller, they add, so women can wash before and after sex. The truth is that every Italian of whatever gender uses the B-Day daily. You're not clean after defecation if you haven't cleansed away every trace of feces. 
except in case of dire necessity, they won't move their bowels anywhere but home next to their own bidet. I remember on a visit to Italy in the early 70s, somehow innocently revealing to an Italian my assumption that he pulled up his pants after only using toilet paper, a major gaffe. Americans say shit in frustration and hot shit in admiration, but have barely a nodding acquaintance with a real thing, with the unfortunate corollary that many of them walk around emanating a faint fecal odor. Italians' acquaintance with their stool is hands-on. When they grasp each other's habits of anal hygiene, each side cordially considers the other filthy. Americans just use toilet paper? Italians watch what with their fingers? Fastidiousness lying in the eye of a washer, an Italian is disgusted by the idea of having bits of feces clinging to her, clinging to her but finds it normal to wash daily there and only there. An American is disgusted by the idea of getting up close and personal with his anus, but can't imagine a day without a shower. One time I was enjoying, enjoying a sauna along with several Roman women when an American came in and sat down naked on the bench. The Italians glared. Seeing that she didn't take the hint, one spoke up and sent her out to find a towel to put under her butt giving them the chance in her absence to rail against filthy foreigners who thoughtlessly contaminate public spaces. Not only won't Italians sit directly on the wood in a sauna, but they will endure painful thigh cramps to avoid putting bare skin on public toilets, which in the name of hygiene are often stripped to seatless porcelain. An Italian patient who works as a tour guide told me, Foreigners are horrified that we don't have toilet seats in public restrooms. We're horrified that they would consider sitting down on one. My take is this. Americans consider our whole underside to be intrinsically dirty and mentally airbrush it out. Italians think bodies are amenable to cleansing, so they're constantly aware of its potential contamination. Goes back to when the Romans, with their mania for washing, lost out to Christians who for centuries considered bathing a sinful cult of the body. In their heart of hearts, it sometimes seems to me that neither Italians nor their physicians fully believe in scientific evidence. Italy's largest pol political party in 2018 is officially anti-vaccination. Um, the five-star people have gone a little bit in in the direction of reason since then. And Italian medicine is full of odd remnants of what may have been up to date when docs now pushing 90 were kids. An overworked liver triggers, triggers conjunctivitis. A dental abscess causes maladies from arthritis to cancer. And most everything else can be explained by the malefic power of drafts. A woman whose heavy periods have left her exhausted with anemia should wait until summer is over before she starts taking iron pills. By law, dead bodies must wait 24 hours between, before being autopsied or embalmed in case the patient wakes up. If you visit a private hospital after sundown, you will find vases of flowers all along the hallways, removed from patients' rooms for the night because of the rather charming concern that the flowers will steal oxygen from the sick. He went around in his Lamborghini, but according to the tax authorities, he's a total evader. My friend Annabella was showing me proudly around her country house, but when I admired the stone-crafted fireplace, she sighed. It had been hard, she said, to get the mason to accept payment in cash. Why in cash? Yeah, you know, my husband doesn't pay taxes, so everything has to be under the table. That was the first I heard of the Italian tax dodger supreme, the evasore totale, or total evader, who's found the final solution to the tax problem, never file a return. Akin to living off the grid, but without the primitivism. The idea is you're less likely to get caught if you're flying entirely under the radar than if you simply underreport your earnings. Most doctors can't achieve total evader status because of their on the books day jobs in public hospitals or national health service offices but in their private practices, they gleefully play cat and mouse with the tax men. A doctor's receipts or fatture are numbered legal documents. Taxes get paid on exactly the sum of your fatture, no more, no less. 
the fear of alienating one's physician by requesting a receipt used to enable whopping tax evasion. I remember one patient many years back, a bureau chief at the Food and Agricultural Organization, who had relentless, undiagnosed leg pain. After dozens of fruitless consultations and failed therapies, I referred him to Professor T, an anesthesiology whiz. One nerve block stopped the pain temporarily, and the giant fee didn't phase my grateful and well-insured patient, but he was never reimbursed because Professor T simply would not give him a receipt. I phoned to beg the professor personally and was told, I'm sorry, dear colleague, but my accountant tells me I've earned too much money already this year. Back then in the early 80s, no physician would spontaneously offer a fatura, and they concocted elaborate techniques for sidestepping the occasional request. Often, the secretary who took the patient's money wouldn't be authorized to give receipts. So if you wanted one, you had to wait humbly until the great man himself had finished his office hours and then be readmitted into the doctor's scowling presence and blurt out your plea face to face. Many abandoned their quest rather than risk hearing piuttosto non mi paghi. If that's the way you feel about it, don't bother to pay me at all with the implied corollary and don't bother to come back. When a Rome labor union briefly ran a tax evasion hotline for citizens to anonymously report abuses, the three most egregious offenders were bars, grocery stores, and doctors. My longtime patient, Carlo, who I've seen through everything from athlete's foot to stroke, decided to haul his paunch in for a checkup. In the two years since I last saw him, he reported having had only one medical encounter, an emergency room visit for a sprained ankle. I ask, but what about your atrial fibrillation, your diabetes, your high blood pressure, your cholesterol, the plaques in your carotid arteries? Oh, I take care of all that myself. I raise an eyebrow. I check my prothrombin time every few months to make sure my anticoagulant dose is okay. I check my blood sugar and blood pressure at home once a week. I adjust my insulin dose and my Vasotec. The pharmacist knows me, so he never asks for a prescription. Italian patients can play this kind of Russian roulette only because their pharmacists wield real clout rather than being mere compliments to physicians. Petitions meekly as dottore or dottoressa they will dispense advice and provide guidance to the purchase of pillboxes laughingly labeled not to be sold without a doctor's prescription. My very first prescription. I had just gotten my license and my husband strained his wrist. So I laboriously followed the instructions I'd been given and wrote a script for indomethacin, the ibuprofen of its time. The pharmacist took the prescription and brought back a box of prednisone pills, a steroid. I had a moment of disorientation. Then I said, excuse me, ma'am, you've brought me the wrong drug by mistake. She, I know, signorina, it's not what the doctor ordered, but the one I'm giving you is much more powerful. It will work better. Some of the potentially deadly drugs I've known pharmacists to dole out for years on end without the patient ever seeing a doctor or doing any testing include methotrexate, a cancer chemotherapy and anti-arthritis drug that can zero out your blood cells and your liver function, Coumadin, an anticoagulant that can easily revert to its original calling as rat poison, interferon, an immune suppressant that can cause lupus, liver failure, and suicide, insulin, low blood sugar can kill you, and prednisone, its myriad complications can include diabetes, tuberculosis, insanity. <clears throat> when I first started working, I was afraid that I would be constantly assailed by passes I couldn't handle. Back then, in the 80s, if you went to the movies alone in Rome, some guy was sure to sit down next to you and let his hands wander. Once when my husband was away, I tried anyway, barricading the seats on either side. Halfway through the film, an arm dropped from the row behind me, landing ever so casually on my breast. As far as my office practice was concerned, it was wasted anxiety. It turns out that female doctors are not sex objects for their patients, much less archetypal ones like nurses. 
An occasional disturbed man may act flirtatious, but that's easy to ignore. The single exception I've encountered was once when a met well-known Rome intellectual reached up from the exam table while I was listening to his heart and squeezed my butt. Grotesque from a man stretched out helpless and nearly naked on my chopping block. I later found out that this particular individual habitually felt women up on crowded buses, the famous mano morta or dead hand. And I was pleased to learn eventually from his wife that his real sex life was pathetic. Um, informant, one who supplies cultural or linguistic data in response to interrogation by an investigator. Example, we learned the language with the help of a native informant, merriamwebster.com. I grew up with a New Yorker. One of my first acts as a Radcliffe freshman was to sign up for my very, very own subscription. When I moved to Rome at age 30, the issues that trickled into my mailbox were a lifeline to hometown culture. The first chip in my bicontinental identity arrived two years later when for the first time I looked at a cartoon and didn't get the joke. That's the poignancy of expatriation. Your native land keeps moving forward without you. American culture, the only one I profoundly know, evolves mercilessly elsewhere as my center of gravity drifts Romewards. It's easy to keep up with the latest anti-hypertensive drugs, but not with the flavor and byways of daily life back in the States. I gain perspective on my own culture at the cost of losing my validity as an insider. My first hint that American English was evolving elsewhere was on holiday, four years after my move to Italy, when someone yelled, yo, in my direction across Harvard Square. I figured it was somebody speaking Spanish and I kept on walking. No, it was an old friend who had to run over and tap me on the shoulder. It never crossed his mind that his greeting surpassed my understanding. Cougars chasing younger men may date back to Catherine the Great, but when I lived in the States, there wasn't a word for them. Homogeneous hadn't started losing its second E. Nuclear wasn't garbling into nuclear. Rooms were free of elephants, guests didn't dine out on anecdotes, and when people networked, they called it socializing. Rocket science was a job, not a metaphor. Robocalls calls didn't exist. Nobody had skin in the game. Nobody went postal, and of course, nothing could go viral. Many brand new terms fit in so snugly that even a native misinformant hardly noticed, such as when I first heard, same old, same old. I've got your back, shout out. Whatever, my bad. I caught on fast to, well, duh, been there, done that, get a life, wannabe, soccer mom, baby bump, stoner, sticker shock, and senior moment. Perp walk, helicopter parent, hottie, ghetto blaster, gangbanger, hookup, and the N-word took some context. I needed serious help with bimbo. In Italian, it means male child. I'm still not sure I really get Euro trash or LOL. This is my, my final slide. In the United States, nobody drops out of medical school. Here's how it works. You spend your first year consorting with cadavers and test tubes. So of course you stick around the next year to learn physiology, history taking and physical examination. But that's just a prelude to the grueling but glorious year three when you play doctor on the wards. Once you've survived the basic clerkships, it would be foolish to quit, since in your final year you can choose your own rotations and even loaf a little. The degree you get after four years is useless by itself, so you'd be silly not to endure the internship that's required to get your medical license. Da cosa nasce cosa. One thing leads to another. It was a little like that with my move to Italy. I came to try working here for a year, and though after twice that time and prodigious effort, I had barely even set up shop, still every advance felt like a triumph. Each new barrier promised to be the last, the joys of living like an Italian, always waiting just around the corner. Nothing could weaken my adoration of the country. Even the end of my Italian marriage after nine years didn't drive me away. When I later took up with Alvin Curran, an American composer who's lived in Rome even longer than I have, what followed wasn't repatriation, 
but a crash course in contemporary music and the addition of another sideline as artist's wife. It never occurred to me to head home. Okay. Thanks a lot, Susan. Bring that off. Um, so um, I, I guess we're going to pass to the question and answer phase. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, uh, I'm Alexander Stilla, and I should mention to any of the participants that as chance would have it, or maybe not chance, I was a patient of Susan's for uh, a period of years, and uh, a period of years that were actually rather um, adventurous in the medical department, because uh, although I was uh, in my early 30s, uh, I came down with um, what turned out to be a fairly serious disease, Hodgkin's disease, when I was living in Rome. And um, that, um, so one, I got to know Susan better in that period, and I got to know the Italian health system uh, quite well um, in ways that were quite interesting. And one of the things that I admire about Susan's book is that it's a way of, I think medicine is a wonderful way uh, a lens through which to look at Italy. Um, a lot of the peculiarities, both the wonderful and somewhat less wonderful things about Italy come into very clear focus when you see them through that lens. And I experienced that um, very much um, myself. Um, uh, in fact, to give you an idea of Susan's um, bedside manner, I'll tell a little story. When I originally had this diagnosis of Hodgkin's disease, my American wife refused to believe it was actually true. She just said, well, the doctors have gotten it wrong. What do they know? So I realized I had to sort of march her into Susan's office to hear from an American doctor. This is like really happening. And um, this is in fact um, the diagnosis. And so she heard this and Susan with her plain spoken American manner um, delivered this. And then I think one of her parting words um, uh, were something like, go home, have sex. You probably won't be doing a lot of that in the next six months. Um, and she didn't use the term uh, have sex either. Um, something a little earthier. So her, uh, her New York origins were, were coming through. Um, so that's one moment. But the other thing I'll say before then passing to questions with Susan, that I think particularly for those who are uh, American, uh, might appreciate. Um, one of the things that was interesting, having a serious disease in a foreign country is, you know, complicated. And uh, I wasn't used to the Italian system. And I had health insurance, so I kept trying to pay. And the Italian public hospital I was going to just didn't know what to do with me. And um, the um, at a certain point, I went to the cashier and I said, I want to pay. And she looked at me with total perplexity. Well, what do you mean pay? And I explained, and I'm a foreigner. I don't have... And um, they had never encountered this before. So they went scurrying around looking for some binder in which they could actually find a price list. And eventually, after several minutes of looking, they found something. And the prices, because they'd never really been used, were totally um, through the roof and really high. And the cashier started adding this up and it, it came to a, a huge sum. And then she started just leaving things off and said, no, this is way too much. Let's leave that out. Let's leave that out. And brought my bill back down to um, what she thought was a, a reasonable level. And then at the end of it, she said, Lee, explain to me this, your situation. What do you need to be doing here? And so on. And I explained a little bit that I had to do chemotherapy, I have to do radiation. And she said, look, I used to work in radiation. Come back when you finish your whatever and talk to me. I'm gonna to talk to my old boss. And essentially this woman who was a cashier in a public hospital arranged for me to be treated off the books for free um, um, during what to prove to be because their radiation machine kept breaking down. It ended up taking many months. So that was the bad side of it. What should have taken two months took four or five, but I was treated for free and treated successfully since here I am. 30 odd years later. Um, so I saw the good and the bad of a system that, um, you know, long lines in a public hospital. It was also very democratic because I wasn't seen before <clears throat> any other patient and, um, and I got high quality treatment. So one thing 
to return to the questions of Susan, um, I'm just sort of curious, you talked a little bit about how you were perceived both by your patients and by your fellow doctors as an American uh, breaking into the system. Italians are not really used to foreigners entering professions like that, which are seen to be a fraternity uh, for them alone. Um, so can you just sort of talk a little bit about that experience? Yeah, it was, I would say that being, being, a, being an American in that circumstance, although it amazed people that I was doing it, nobody, I kept on all through the process of getting my license, people kept on asking me, what on earth are you moving to Italy for? Um, because everybody assumed that things were so much better in the States. Um, I think I didn't, have, I didn't have so much problem because I wasn't Italian. In other words, an Italian who goes to the United States to do a residency, to do a specialization, and then comes back to Italy and wants to get into the, in, into the system, they get treated terribly because they mm -hmm. betrayed their country. Right. They went elsewhere. But I hadn't done that. I was just coming in. Um, also, uh, I didn't want to get into the system. And I couldn't, actually, for various reasons, because I was too old at the age of 30. I wasn't able to get into the public system for one reason or you know, all sorts of reasons, which I explain in the book. Um, and because of that, I wasn't a threat to anybody because the public system is where the power is. So mm -hmm. I was never going to be looking for power. Mm -hmm. and, and, and patients, the, the only reason that I could get any patients was because I was American. I mean, any Italian patients. Because in Italy, what counted more than the being American what was more in, more important was really my being 30 years old. And in Italy, a 30-year-old person is not in private practice. Mm -hmm. They're all the high ups, the high, uh, the high professori in the, in the university, what they mm -hmm. used to call barons. Um, those are the people who are in private practice. Um, so that it was, it was something that was odd that I was doing it. And it would make, make people didn't trust me. But the American side sort of made up for that. Uh huh. And um, did the um, did the Italian patients, because you were American, think, oh, well, America is uh, at the sort of center of scientific activity, therefore she must know what she's doing? Or on the contrary, did they think, um, I don't quite trust her because she's um, American? Oh, I, th I think the the idea was that 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 Amer since Amer America is great, mm. grande. Um, that I would be better than anybody else. Otherwise, they wouldn't. They would have never come to a thirty-year-old. Right. But I did get a fair number of Italian patients right from the very start. Mm -hmm. By and large, they were doctor shopping. They were the sort of people who would go to one after another. Mm -hmm. um, you, uh, a number of points in your book, use the term stregone uh, or wizard to translate it into um, English mm -hmm. for the attitude that many Italians had toward doctors in general. Can you explain that concept and how it worked in terms of um, people's relationship with doctors? That's interesting. I mentioned before in one of the readings that Italian, that at a certain level, there is a certain mistrust of science. And when I came, which is 40 years ago by now, when I came to Italy, um, it was obviously much stronger at the time. And whereas in the United States or in England or probably in France and Germany, I don't know the you know I don't know other countries as well, um, doctors by and large, whatever the disease is that you have, the doctor will more or less do the same thing. There's a party line and it gets followed. Mm -hmm. Italians have party lines when it comes to when it, when it comes to medicine and when it comes to many other things. And they, what they really believe in and what they particularly used to believe in was that every doctor had their own magic. And that mm. would extend to the prescriptions that they would write. It would, it would extend to the, you know, to the process that they would follow. I remember, a, I can't remember if I put this in the book, you know, a, a, an Italian doctor, a young woman who went to England and spent a year doing some sort of a specialization or rotation or something like that. And I talked to her after she came back and I said, hey, how was it? You know, I thought that she was gonna say, oh, that was, was really great because in, in the, the hospital that she had been in was a very top flight hospital. And she said, oh, it's just terrible. They all just follow the rules. Mm. So that's, that's what the stregoni are. Nowadays, nowadays there's more of, a, of an expectation 
expectation that a doctor will actually you know, follow. More of an expectation of science, I think. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. One thing that is very notable um, is that Italy, along with uh, Japan, um, has among the highest levels of longevity of anywhere in the world. Um, and so as a doctor, you must have thought a little bit about what are Italians doing right that uh, accounts for that. America has more Nobel Prize winners in uh, medicine, but we have shorter lives. Um, America not only has more Nobel Prize winners, it also spends three times as much as Italy on healthcare. And what they get for that is in return is not only five years, between four and five years, depending on what year you're looking at, five years shorter longevity. They live five years less than Italians do. And they're also less healthy by every other measure that you can find and by all kinds of diseases. Um, and I think that this is fully accounted for by two things. One of them is having a national health service that it has its holes, it has its problems, its doctors can be limited, there is, it's vastly underfunded, you know, they, the machines break down, like you said, and so on and so forth, but it is absolutely universal. Everybody is covered by it and nobody has to skip medical care because they don't have the money. And this is enormous. It makes a huge difference in health. Um, I think that it's even better that they, they have even less copays than the English do. Um, the other aspect of it is that Italy has a pretty healthy lifestyle. Mm -hmm. You know, like I said about, uh, like, you know, I, talk, I talked about booze, about mm -hmm. how, how many fewer alcoholics there are. Um, there's a lot less drug use, one reason or another. You know, you can, anybody, any doctor can freely prescribe the equivalent of Oxycontin, not Oxycontin exactly, Percocet. You, know, yeah. you can just prescribe it. Anybody yeah. can prescribe it on a regular prescription. Anybody can go out and buy it but it is not abused. Explain it to me. I don't know. It's just, there's just something about the Italian thing. Also, Italians walk places. They don't yeah. take, the, you know, they walk places when, it, when Americans would take their cars. There are many ways they eat a much healthier diet um, without fussing about it and without thinking that they're doing something very special. Um, so, bet and they, they don't drive drunk. They drive crazy, mm -hmm. but they don't drive drunk as much. Um, there's been, something of a fad of that among young Italians, but I think that it may be fading away, especially now that they've been locked down for months. Mm -hmm. um, but the, between one thing and another, the, health, the healthy lifestyle and the complete coverage for all medical things, you know, they, it really pays, pays right. off. Um, at the same time, there are certain, you, you do tell some fairly harrowing stories of um, patients who uh, don't get attended at hospitals, spend three or four days before being examined or giving given medication. You refer to um, Italian patients who have survived a few days in the intensive care unit as um, uh, miracolati, um, you know, miracle people. Um, can you talk about the institutions or the or the parts of the system where it breaks down or doesn't work well? What I say in the book is it's a crapshoot. You know, you got treated marvelously. I, you know, aside from minor, minor glitches, and, you, mm -hmm. and I know of some other, other minor glitches that you haven't mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, but I've had, you know, I, I had another patient who I describe in the book who also had a blood cancer um, and who also had Hodgkin's disease actually, and was allowed nearly to die um, because of medical idiocy, because the doctors didn't have judgment. It's a, it's a very strange thing. Um, the Italian medical system still, even though it, the medical training has improved, still Italian doctors don't get the kind of bedside training and training in judgment that they do in other countries. So there's, there are issues about, about the doctors. Um, 
what else in the hospital? There's, I mean, of course, the, the, under, the underfunding means that there aren't enough nurses and there aren't enough machines and, and so on and so forth. Those, thing, those, those things are obvious and they're very, very significant. But they're able to respond when in a pinch. I mean, one thing, you know, I felt bad in this period a little bit because my, because my book tends to be read largely as a, as a criticism on, you know, on the negative side of the Italian medical system. Um, and people have pointed this out in the present context. And since in, this, in these last months, Italian doctors, nurses, and hospitals have not only given their all, but they have done a fantastic job given the resources that they had to, well, to and overcome and Bergamo, given their life. What? In places like Bergamo, given their lives. Given their, 165 doctors at last count, doctors died of COVID. I mean, it's it's really really amazing. Yeah, um, very, so, so it's not a, it's a period where I would have rather not been sort of known by some people as being as being critical of the Italian medical system. Mm -hmm. And um, though something else you 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 mentioned and it it resonated um, uh, with me um, uh, with with uh, my experience when. Um, we were still trying to straighten out my um, uh, insurance situation. And one of the doctors said, well, like, we have to start this radiation right away. I can't wait for the bureaucratic stuff. Important thing is that you be treated. The rest is secondary. And that kind of attitude, I mean, to an American, that's like virtually inconceivable. Like you don't have an insurance card, you're not getting through the door. Um, and you mentioned you have a nice little story about your mother, which doesn't strictly have to do with medicine, but it has to do with her um, uh, taking a bus up to Assisi and an older man needing to relieve himself um, and the bus driver stopping and letting him take a pee somewhere by the side of the road and nobody complaining. And you said, if this had been the United States, it was, wait a second, this isn't a scheduled stop. And why did you stop for him? And why not for some? But there was a kind of attitude of, hey, look, the poor guy is an older man. He may have a prostate problem. You know, he needs to be. Um, that there's a kind of caring in the Italian system. It also does translate into the medical system. So I wonder if you could just talk a little about that. I think that Italians are real stars at human relations. You know, they're, they are the best around, they're the most loyal friends, and they know how to interact with people and they know how to care about people. Now, sometimes they can, you know, you try an Italian call center, it all depends, you know, you, you, you call up somebody to try to get help on a, you know, at a, at a, call, at a, at a call center and it's completely the luck of a draw because they have to relate to you. If they don't relate to you, then they will treat you like dirt. They'll treat you as much like dirt as any American would. Mm -hmm. uh, but they, they're much more likely to try to relate to you. Um, and that's true in normal life and it's true in medicine. But the problem, you know, you just, you just never know what you're, going, what you're going to find. That's why I say it's a crapshoot. I mean, for example, I mean, a little, little example. Um, if you get, if you've got a cut out on the street and a, a contaminated, no, no, that's not the best example. The better example is if you, have an, if you have anaphylactic shock or you have anaphylaxis, you go into an emergency room with a, you know, and you're, and you're wheezing and you've just, been, you know, you've just been stung by a bee that you're allergic to or whatever, the chances are about two out of three that you're going to get adrenaline, which will save your life. In one out of three cases, the person in that the, the people who run the emergency room don't believe in adrenaline and they give you instead they give you cortisone which takes hours to work instead of minutes so if you survive you're lucky and it's purely one out of three that's that's the way it works you, and it's very hard to predict it's hard to predict what what a specific place will be like it's hard to predict what a specific doctor will be like or or how a specific patient will be taken and my now, you know, one of three is true in Italy as well as the U.S. or or both or both. In the United States, things tend to go go sort of by the rules. You get plugged into the system, and 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 they do what what it's going to do, whether they care about you or not. Right. I think it's more predictable. Mm -hmm. that's, that's my um, impression. 
I, I, and I, I think that I probably tend to idealize American medicine a little, and I, I admit that, partly mm -hmm. because I've never had to deal with it, almost never had to deal with it as a patient. Right. No, I mean, in my experience, it, it works uh, fine if you're well insured and you know what you're doing. Um, you can get very tough treatment, but, um, but I've also seen some, some egregious, egregious examples of incredible uh, arrogance. I remember when my father was very ill and his Italian doctors had diagnosed him correctly as having a, a badly, badly uh, leaking heart valve. And um, I took him back to um, the States and his American doctor says, oh, these Italian doctors don't know anything. Uh, you don't know what you're talking about. He, he doesn't have this. It was completely wrong. The Italians were totally right in this overpaid cardiologist didn't know what he was talking about. And when he got, went to see a specialist, the guy said, you're not even leaving the office. We're taking you right now for valve replacement surgery. So anyway, um, one thing I thought um, that, uh, that I um, um, read in your book that rang very true to me was um, talk about the different attitudes toward um, doctors in Italy delivering bad news uh, to patients and you know, uh, particularly um, diseases with very, um, you know, poor outcomes. If you can talk about that kind of cultural difference that you, you noticed around the issue of death and illness um, and how Italians handle that compared to Americans. This is something that's evolved considerably. When I first came to Italy, nobody ever told a patient that they had cancer. That they had a term that they had a terminal form of cancer. It just did not happen. And I would have people tell me that they wouldn't they wouldn't bring a pay, they wouldn't bring their relative to me because they were afraid that I would tell them. Um, and by this time in the states, it had already become been the brutal thing that it is nowadays. Which there they say, you know, you have cancer, you have six months to live goodbye. You know, there's it's the, sort of on on the other side. Um, and one of one um, Cosimo Prantera, who was my 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 mentor and my <clears throat> the person who I've done research with for the last forty nearly forty years at the Nuova Regina Margherita first and then another hospital, he once told me that if he had cancer, he wouldn't want to know. He would want somebody to find a lie and tell him the lie. Um, and he was the primario of the he was the head of the medical ward. Um, it, to me, this was in, totally incomprehensible, especially, you know, because patients, in my experience, and also, I think, in, in the literature, they, they usually figure it out. They know that they have something very, very bad. They know, they sense that they're going to die, and they have to be able to talk to people about it. And Italian, I would try to explain to Italians that this was the case, and they, you know, that they were leaving their relative to be... Um, to be to be lonely to live that period without being able to share their fears and their feelings and and and, and their emotions, um, but but they wouldn't buy it. Things have changed now. That's something that has evolved partly because more cancers have become curable, and you can offer more in the way of you know you can you can offer more. Does that sort of? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um... What are some of the things that you decided or that you left out of the book, whether you have subsequently wished you'd included or ones that you left out and were all things considered so glad that you did, um, but that... Yeah, well, I had to go through a lot to disguise patients. You know, very often I changed I change their gender, I change their nationality, you know, I change all kinds of things in order to be quite sure that nobody will ever recognize a patient except mm -hmm. possibly that patient themselves. Right. Um, so that, that I had to do, but that, that's obvious. That, that goes mm -hmm. without saying. Um, but at, at a certain point, um, Mike Mushaw, who was really my literary mentor, he was the one who pushed me, sort of pushed me into writing the book in the first place. Um, he's a, you know, a writer himself, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, and he, Now, what was I talking about? I just, I just had a what senior moment. Out, what you left out. What I left out. Yeah, he suggested to me, after I had a draft of the book, 
um, he said, look, I know that you have examined, you have made a house call on one of the absolutely most famous and most, and most powerful people in Italy. Why don't you write that up and put it into the book? In fact, make it the first, be the beginning of the book, make it the opening, and that will grab everybody's attention. And I did, I wrote up this very nice piece and you know, it's a beautiful piece and it will never see the light of day. It can never be published because it was, you know, there was no way of disguising the person and it said all kinds of details about them. It took me a long time to catch on that I had to leave this out of the book. Mm -hmm. Now, once I caught on to that one, I realized that there were other things in the book that people could get offended at. And so I, I sent around to every person who I mentioned by name or easily recognizable, which there were, a, you know, maybe a dozen of them, I sent them around the piece that, 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 re, that related to them to ask them whether it was okay that I published this. Um, and most of them said, yes, it was fine. But one of my colleagues who I had, I had described what he had, how he had behaved when, you know, in, uh, around walking out of an office, leaving, leaving an office and abandoning the rest of us. Um, in a very nasty way. Um, I described some of the nastiness, but I had to leave out the, the hottest parts of it because I could see that, that you know, he told me, you, you mention that stuff and I will sue you. And I went to a lawyer and I asked him to look at all kinds of things. And he, you know, he got me, I, you know, I talked about, about um, what, oh, what's his name, Marino, the ex-mayor of Rome, who's a doctor. Yeah. And I talked about him at the book, in the book at a certain time, at a certain point. And I had to tone that down also because the lawyer said to me, look, this guy, Marino, has sued people for saying less. I said, but every word that I've said is true. It is demonstrably true. I said, it doesn't matter. Yeah, well, I learned from writing about Berlusconi that in the United States, truth is an absolute defense, but in Italy, it is not. You can write something that is true and defamatory. Um, so... And also, you can write something that is true about a dead person and it's defamatory. In the United States, you, can't, you cannot defame a person who's dead. In Italy, you can. And so mm -hmm. I had to do a lot of other disguising of another nasty person because mm -hmm. of that. Um, you mentioned uh, a little, uh, a couple minutes ago, the word gender. And I wonder, you were both an American and a woman and we're in a position to observe gender relations up close and personal. Um, and those have changed a lot over 40 years. As you said, um, when you uh, went to the movies in the early 80s, it was impossible not to be um, harassed by somebody. Um, you know, my mother who went to Italy first time in the late 40s or early 50s was like followed around Rome um, and whistled at. Um, you know, um, but I wonder if you can talk about gender relations and how that intersects with um, medicine and your experience. I'll just I'll say very, very briefly um, that it's been less of a problem than I anticipated and less of a problem than other people anticipated. When I first came to Italy, I had Italians tell me, you will never see an Italian male patient. And they said that to me right on. You know, no problem, no question about it. And it's not true. I have a lot of Italian male patients. Um, obviously, they're the ones who choose to go to a female, you know, they're one for whom a, a certain reputation or being American or whatever it is trumps the fact of being a woman. But I, you know, I haven't had, I really don't think that it's been a problem. And I, and I should say that when I came to Italy, Nilde Yotti, who was a woman, was mm -hmm. the the head of the of the uh, parliament, know, yeah. Margherita Hack was the leading astrophysicist, mm -hmm. and Rita Mon uh, Levi Montial yeah, Montalcini yeah, yeah. was the latest Nobel Prize winner in medicine. So there was a lot of high level women. It wasn't so strange. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, one of my favorite anecdotes, and I actually read it out loud to uh, someone when I was reading it, was when you. Um, had to sub for a partner of yours, a male partner who was too busy to see patients. And the, the patient who came to you was an Iranian diplomat. And so he suddenly faced with what you call sort of like a triple threat. So you're female, he's not supposed to, you know, uh, deal, you know, fish shake the hand of a, you know, of a woman that isn't his wife or daughter. Um, 
an American, so uh, the great Satan, and three Jewish. Uh, and to boot, you had to perform a rectal exam on the poor man. Uh, he was, his diplomatic side came to the fore. He was wonderful. He accepted everything. He did it all, you know. And at, at the end, he, you know, he thanked me. And he, you know, thanked me for my professionality. I thanked him for his acceptance and mm -hmm. for, his, for his tolerance. I, there was another incident that I, that I described in the book, actually, about, about a Jewish person. I don't know mm -hmm. if you remember that, where they, this was a guy who was a Hasidic Jew, and he came into the hospital when I was a medical student. He was one of my very first patients. But, you know, and when you're a medical student in the States, you're the first person to see the patient. You take the history, you do a physical, and so on. And this person had had black stool. So you know, I think that that was what he said. And so I did a rectal examination on him. Did a rectal examination. I, I saw the black stool. I tested it for blood. It was positive. I said, oh, wow, I have a diagnosis. I have my first patient, and he has an ulcer. This is great. And then you know, I went and I presented the patient. And the next day, we heard that during the night, his wife had had a baby. And so I walked up to him, and I put out my hand. I said, congratulations, mazel tov. And he yeah. wouldn't touch my hand because he was allowed to be touched for medical purposes if it was necessary, which happened, again, to include a rectal exam, but he couldn't right. voluntarily touch a woman because she might be menstruating. Well, that's, that's the beauty of the Talmud, uh, <laughs> the interpretation of it, so that you can always find a way around what looks like a hard and fast um, uh, taboo. Right. Um, so um, I wonder if... Um, people out in the, among the participants have questions because we've been going for a little while. We started two, we're now at three. So people may have um, um, questions they want to ask um, Susan, anybody, you can use the chat function to do that if you. Okay, I think that there may be some here. <laughs> I have somebody, somebody here who has read the book said, this book is such a, a roundup of Italian typical characters with all typical flaws and saving graces that reminds me of Alberto Sordi or Carlo Verdone's movies. Okay. Ah. And another, another comment, which I, will, which I will also read out. Well, I, should I read the comments? Because people, other people can, well, mm -hmm. Susan, right away, I was struck with two parallels with my experiences in East Pakistan, now Bangladesh, in the 60s. First, the unquestioned infallibility of the professor. The only difference was that there was one authority almost equivalent to that of the professor. It is written. If a medical axiom was in print anywhere, it was equivalent to Holy Scripture for a fundamentalist. Um, and that's interesting because it, it is one of the things that when I, you know, I, I mentioned at some point in the book, I think, that, uh, that I talked about grand rounds, the concept of grand rounds, um, which, in which somebody gets up and is invited to give an authoritative speech about some subject. And the person who I was telling it to, the Italian, said that was, was something that couldn't happen in Italy um, because how, that would mean that there was somebody there who knows more than the professore. Um, and then the rest. Second was the technique of obtaining an official certificate. My wife needed her driver's license, so a local friend, the son of a, of a high court justice, introduced her to the chief of police. He, he shook her hand and presented her with a license. Qualche tradizione universale. From David Soccer. Thank you, David. Um, one person here has a question of um, whether your time back in the States during the pandemic um, has changed your uh, perspective on all of this. Well, part of that I talked about before about the about how well the Italian Italian yeah. and Italian hospitals came through, and uh, you know also about my reputation with the book. Um, I mean, and it certainly pointed up the advantage of being in a real country like Italy, where somebody, the chief, the, 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 where the prime minister can say, we are going to have a lockdown, and there is a lockdown. I, mean, in the United, the, I never realized until this period in the United States that the United States really is 50 different countries. 
and each of them can mostly do what they want. And unfortunately, what they have chosen to do during this period was mostly very, very ill-considered. Um. <laughs> and then um, a question here, um, uh, what do you perceive as your role with internationals? Any experience or advice you would give to new families with regards to medical services in Italy? I think that the, the main thing would always be that when you're going to deal with the with public or private, whatever it is, get directed by somebody else. You know, get a recommendation in the American sense. Have somebody tell you who to go to. Best if it's a doctor who you trust that tells you where to go. You know, for example, if you're you know some some serious illness and you need to go to the hospital. You know, I, I will advise you because it is a crapshoot, because there is a risk of running into some, you know, you don't know whether you're going to be treated at the top of medicine or at the bottom of medicine. There is, unfortunately, that's the problem with Italy. There's no, there's no baseline of guaranteed competence. So that would be my, that's generally my advice to new families who are there. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, uh, another... Um, I'll practice yeah, uh, well, there's a thing on the hierarchical system of academic medicine question, whether you've... Is question? question is, um, this person writes that he has been struck by the hierarchical system in academic medicine, where it is hard to get an academic appointment until someone vacates that position by dying. Um, and any practice guidelines making head headway in Italy, anyway. Um, about the first thing, I really can't answer anything because I've never been in the public system except to do, um, to do research with Cosimo, your and my common friend. Mm -hmm. um, and so I really can't say anything about the situation, about the, about the faculty appointments. Mm -hmm. um, what I can say is that guidelines are starting to make way. Um, but there still are the remnants of that old stregone system where, you know, every, where it's, it's, expect, it's hoped that your person will have a special approach rather than just following the rules. Mm -hmm. I'd say that that's, that still exists. And then there's a question about malpractice, whether that um, helps. Okay. To and that also, there's also the stregone thing. When I first came to Italy, nobody sued their doctor. Now, a lot of them sue their doctors. Um, mostly they sue the hospitals for very serious things for people who die, and they sue both the hospital and all the doctors in it. Um, but occasionally a private physician will be sued or an individual, you know, what, what, whatever. Um, and the reason in, for me, it has to do with the witch doctor thing, because you don't sue your witch doctor. You know, if, they're, if their spell doesn't work, they don't consider it to have been guaranteed. Whereas if you start to believe in scientific medicine, then you do have certain expectations right. of having a good output, an, a good outcome. I must say that still the, the, the I can't remember the numbers. I think I, I put the latest ones into the book, but um, my, my medical insurance for me as an internist in the United States at this time, I think would cost me something like $30,000 a year, that sort of order of magnitude. In Italy, it cost me 500. Cost right. I just paid it. It was 450 euros, which is about 500 dollars, um, which tells you both, you know, how how little people sue and how little they sue for. They don't get yeah. these million dollar settlements. Right. Uh, here's a, a question that I'm uh, very fond of because it's always been a, a mystery. Anyone who has uh, ridden on an Italian train in August and tried to open the window has then been uh, confronted with the expression colpo d'aria or colpo di vento by alarmed people who demand that you close the window immediately and die of suffocation. Um, so Nadia Zonas is asking whether there is any medical validity to the colpo di vento philosophy. Hey, Nadia, glad to see you. I don't see you, but I'm glad to see, glad to see your, your, your name. Haven't seen you in, the, in person for a long time. Um, I'll tell you, I mean, I've never believed in any of this stuff at all. And the Italian business is so crazy. You know, you have diarrhea, it's because you got a colpo di vento on your stomach and you have, you know, whatever. Um, but I remember once my dear late friend, Edith Schloss, um, she told me that her 
who came from Germany originally. She was, she was born in 1920 or so. And she said that her, she was always brought up to know that you shouldn't lie down on the grass in the spring. Okay. Now, I said, this is ridiculous. And it was the spring, it was a beautiful day. I went to the Circo Massimo. I lay down on the grass, on this beautiful, cool grass. And I got up and I had, for like the first time in my life, I had backache for the next three days. So that, you know, I will give it that much. It wasn't a culpa d'aria, but it was the equivalent kind of a thing. But by and large, I think that there is, that there is absolutely nothing to it, no. Right. Um, so a couple of people wanted to know, if your book will be out in Italian and what you, if you were going to write another? Um, two different questions. I certainly hope that the book will be translated into Italian. I have, you know, I have, I have somebody who is actually trying to work on that now. I've, you know, I worked on it a fair amount. I had Furio Colombo working on it for a while. Um, and, you know, we all, we all sort of, got to the point of giving up, but now I have a person who I will, for Scaramancia, I will cross my fingers and not mention who or how, but, there, but it is being worked on. And I think that now there's a chance of it's happening. Um, next book, it's interesting because I had an idea for my next book, which I won't tell you, um, but which was very personal. It was about, you know, it was about, about personal experiences as a patient, actually, I will tell you about personal experiences as a patient and how, how a doctor lives those experiences. And, and I thought it would, be, it would be very funny. I mean, I, there are a lot of funny things that I can write about. Fortunately, I haven't had anything extremely serious, so I don't have anything really tragic to write about that particular subject. But in the last, in the three months that I was in, in the United States where I was stranded by the coronavirus, I was um, forced into, I wasn't seeing patients, of course, and not being a doctor, I used my blog, Stethoscope on Rome, which I usually put out and I put a post once or twice a month. Um, I started blogging there every week and trying to you know, put out information about the coronavirus and put out things about treatment for COVID. And it had concentrated on that. And I, after doing that for a long time, you know, putting, I don't know how many, 10, 12 of those, of, of those, um, of those blog posts, um, I've started thinking that maybe I could write something interesting, you know, brief about the, about the current situation, about the pandemic from the perspective of somebody who's been from two, who has a close knowledge of an intimate knowledge of the medical system and so on of the, of, and, and the countries, two of the protagonist countries. Yeah. Not on China, but Italy and Italy and the United States right. are the other two big ones. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking about that. Mm -hmm. um, and um, your thoughts on the pandemic is too much. Yeah. <laughs> Please talk some about it. I think you you answered in some of the questions. And uh, someone um, asked how much Italian you knew before and what drew you to Italy. Um, I traveled in Italy. I went to Italy first in 1970, that picture of me in Sardinia in a, in a mm -hmm. mini skirt. Um, and at that time, nobody spoke English in Italy. Yeah. I spoke fairly good French. I learned it in high school. And, but there, and if anything, if people spoke anything, they spoke French. Um, but there weren't that many, you know, it was only educated people who spoke any French. So I really had to learn Italian and I learned Italian. And, and of course, I, you know, I was whatever I was, 22 years old. When you're 22 years old, you can learn languages immediately. And I did. I, you know, by the time I was, I was back in the States, I could, I could, I could talk quite well. Um, I couldn't read, I couldn't write. But um, I remember the first, the first letter that I wrote in Italian, I wrote, O avuto, or something like that, and I wrote O as an O. I didn't know that there was an H in front of yeah. it. No, I really did not right. know anything about that. But it meant that by the time I came back to Italy a few years, and then I married an Italian, and our, no, no, that's not true. When, I, when we were in the States, we spoke English together. But I did speak reasonable Italian before I came, so it wasn't a, it wasn't a big struggle. And of course, knowing French had enabled me a great deal, because it's the same, basically the same grammar and the same and a lot of the same vocabulary. So I, I lucked out. Mm -hmm. 
Um, someone asked about Manjari and Bianco, which you do talk about in your book, and uh, whether that exists in the U.S., whether it has any validity. I don't know. You tell me. Does it, does it exist in the U.S.? Yeah, I think there are, well, there, there are times when you're supposed to eat things that are um, easy on your stomach, plain rice, um, if you're having gastric problems, um, you know, simple brodo, um, you know, things like that. So I think that does exist here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not, quite as, not, sort of not a, quite as intensely and, and as universally applied as in Italy, right. but of course, and, and mostly in relation to gastrointestinal problems. Yeah. Um, and um, what did I like most about Italy, and maybe the least? I'll t what I like most about Italy, I will tell you, is the is Italian people. And you know, I I found traveling around Italy when I was twenty two to be a liberating, life changing experience, because Italians are so accepting. They still are. They're they're accepting. They're tolerant. They're interested in you genuinely. They mm -hmm. you know. For me, this was something that was new. You know, it's not in the, it, it's not in the culture that I came from, which was a, a pretty highly competitive, intellectual, critic, hypercritical, judgmental atmosphere. And it, and Italy is the is the opposite of that. I don't. I ah, I think I'll leave the least question. Mm -hmm. okay. um. And I did not. I never studied Italian before I arrived in Italy. Actually, I mean, except that when. When I was doing my pre-med year, when I had to take medical, medical, um, uh, I had to take chemist, chemistry and so on to get to, to get into medical school in the States, I did have to fill out the courses and I took a course in, in Italian. Um, so I did learn that, an, that there's an H on, on, you know, on, on those words. Um, mm -hmm. so, I, so I did do a two month, three, three month, one, one trimester of a advanced course in Italian. That was what, you know, what you learned out of traveling in Italy at age 22 for three, for, for three months that I learned, put in, go into an advanced class. Mm -hmm. um, but that's it. I never, I never studied it otherwise. I just picked mm -hmm. it up. Um, I think I've answered what drew me to Italy. Yeah. Um, well, I, th I think that's been a great discussion. Um, anything you want to add, Susan, at the end? Okay, now I've already talked about the COVID response. And I'll just, yeah. say, I'll just say one thing about there's Somebody asked, how do you think that Italians would perceive your book? Um, and, and there are people who have taken it badly. There are people who say you are absolutely right. And the latter tend to be physicians, I have to say, because doctors are very acutely aware of the limitations of their, of, of, of the medical care in Italy. Um, one, one time when I told one of the colleagues in my office, um, Fabio Zanoni, I told him that I was going to be writing a book about my experiences with medicine in Italy. He said, make sure it doesn't come out until after you've retired. <laughs> and, you know, they're gonna jump on you. But it hasn't happened. And, but partly that's because Italians are nice people. They do not like to criticize. You know, the, it, the image that, it's, that Americans sometimes have of Italians yeah. is of them exploding and screaming and yelling and so on. But yeah. in a serious way, they, don't, they, they, they really avoid conflict and avoid criticism of other right. people. Also, I, I don't think it's an uh, overwhelmingly negative portrait anyway. I think it's a mixed bag, which is what the reality is. So... It's true, and I, I want to mention that they, I, you know, I think actually, I mean, there's some things, you know, there's one chapter, the medical training chapter. I think I was too hard on Italy, and I, I've actually written a revision of it that I hope, if there's ever a second edition, I want it to be in there. Um, but, um, yeah, I. Th but one of the reasons why the the anecdotes in the book, there are two reasons. Well, okay, one reason why the, the anecdotes tend to be of bad things, and there are strikingly horrible things that I describe in that book. And, but one of the reasons is that I would hear something negative from a patient that would tell me a story, and I wouldn't want, you know, I'm trained, I was trained not to criticize my colleagues in front of a patient. And so I would, instead of saying anything to the patient, like your doctor is an idiot, that person doesn't know what they're talking about, whatever, I would go home and I would write it down. And then I would write it up later and it would, and it 
would eventually make its way into the book. Right. Um, and am I still carrying a full load of patients? Do I plan retiring? Um, I am still carrying a half load of patients, I would say. I've cut back gradually over the last few years. I'm now 72 years old. And I, the R word, you know, there's not a, a week that passes without the R word coming into my mind. And I have to say that after three months of not doctoring, it's easier to imagine that because it's easier to imagine being a full-time writer rather than, you know, rather than being a part-time writer and a more or less full-time doctor. But I don't know. I mean, I'm, I've promised myself that I'm going to give it a few months now and see how I feel about it. Yeah, current debates in an election year in the U.S., damn. I mean, I, I think that people have learned something of a lesson from, from what's happened with COVID. I hope that they have. I mean, yeah. healthcare should be a human right, just like having, you know, just like having water, just like having um, you know, a fire department. You know, that should be one of the things that you expect to happen and you, that you expect to get from your, from, from your, from your government, from, from your culture. And right. I think that, that, the, that Americans are going, are, they've already moved a lot in that direction. You know, as long as one throws out the sort of bugabear or whatever you call it of getting rid of private insurance, which is something that, you know, even in Italy, even every place, you know, there's private insurance in Italy, there's private insurance in Canada, in, in, right. uh, in England, in all of these countries that have universal health care. They also have some, pro some, there is some role for private insurance. Once yeah. you get rid of that as an issue, um, right. which I think it's more or less been thrown out by everybody, I think I have, I have hoped that in the next, you know, in, in, in the next four years, and if not in the next eight years, that there will be universal health care in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm uh, glad that somebody mentioned something about the lack of public health care having a lot to do with racism in the United States. Um, I do discuss the, the impact in my book. I discuss a certain amount, the impact of racism on medicine in the United States. Um, and that's it. Okay. Right. Oh, oh, somebody asked, um, this, is, this is for you, Senor Barlera, um, asking, yes. will there be a recording? Yes. yes. And where can we see it? Yes, the, the, the presentation is being recorded and it will avail be available on our um, um, YouTube channel, the Inst Italian Cultural Institute YouTube channel, in a few days. Um, so I hope that it can be circulated. If you have friends who uh, have not been able to follow, uh, you can forward the link, and and uh, uh, that's it. Right. Uh, um, I want al also to remind uh, the viewers that. Um, uh, in July, we still have uh, two webinars dedicated to Raffaello, Raphael, uh, the painter and architect, uh, because it's the 500th anniversary from his death, and there's a lot of uh, initiatives going on. Um, uh, and uh, we still hope to be able to reopen in, in the fall, but as things stand now, we really don't know. Uh, what to what to say and what to think. Anyway, uh, thank you both for for an enlightening and, and lively presentation, and uh, uh, I hope to see you soon. Okay. Uh, and thank you to all, all our viewers. Uh, keep following us, uh, our website and our socials and our YouTube channel. Okay. Thank you so cool. much for making this That's possible. Nice. And, and somebody just wrote, I should remind you all that you can buy my book if you want at Amazon and all the usual places. Okay. Be well. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Buonasera. Buonasera. Buongiorno.